great deal of admiration and respect for by somebody who, uh, after working with you over the past few years at a distance, uh, somebody who I can certainly call a friend, or a colleague, and, uh, and somebody from whom I've learned a great deal. So I would like to introduce you to our first speaker tonight. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Randy Levante. He is the CEO of the Canadian e-learning network called Can e Learn, which I hope you're familiar with. And if not, check it out at canelearn.net. And he's a national, not, it's a national nonprofit e-learning network dedicated to supporting online and blended learning practices in Canada. Randy has more than 30 years experience as a teacher, administrator, and consultant. His doctoral research on leadership and online learning led to his work surrounding changes in BC policy, agreements, and e-learning standards. His consulting work has also included distance education support for Alberta rural and remote learners and providers at the secondary and post-secondary level. Randy's publications include papers on quality, standards, and leadership for e-learning. He's an adjunct professor at Vancouver Island University where he teaches online courses for K-12 educators shifting practices to online learning environments. And on a personal note, I sit on the board of directors for Can eLearn, of which Andy, uh, Randy is the CEO. And uh, on behalf of all of the board members, uh, Randy, we, we certainly appreciate all of the work that you do for eLearning in Canada. And post-announcement, all of the work that you've done with regard to uh, the limelight on which has been cast on e-learning here in Ontario. So we're the very positive excited. limelight, right? The positive limelight yeah. here in Ontario. So I hope you followed his work online. I hope that you've uh, read some of uh, the work of him and Dr. Michael Barber. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating, accurate perspective, solid research, and something that uh, can help us all in all of our portfolios. Randy, welcome. Thank you, Todd. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to stand a little close to this, not because I usually walk around and flap my arms, um, but because we're live streaming as well, so we have an online audience um, that are watching, as well as we're recording this through Zoom, uh, so that we will also post it to our YouTube channel so that it's available for others that can't be here. So those that are live hopefully can chime in live as well uh, to uh, part of this uh, presentation. So Todd gives you a mouthful. It's, I, I am the very lucky person, is that I'm able to sustain myself and continue to do what it is that drives me passionately in education and continue to feel like I make a difference. And I have to say, I gave up security and I gave up assurances. I gave up predictability, but I also gave up bureaucracy. So there's a trade-off, but there's a win on the side of it. And if I had to do it again, I would do it the same way. It kind of helps that my dad kind of led his life that way. And I remember as a five-year-old uh, in the back of a Renault, if you can remember that, <laughs> the car, and it was the little two-seater two kind of, anyway, I was in the back and I had my pet turtle. And I was going on this thing called the Kaloki, which was a black bulb ferry, which then became the BC ferries, from Vancouver to a place called Nanimo. Actually, it's called Nanaimo. <laughs> but uh, it was one of these really kind of freaky things. But my dad ripped us out of his job on a whim, we thought, so did my mother, <laughs> on a whim to go and build a business in Nanaimo, selling anything. So he started as the trading center and he would trade anything and sell anything. And he turned it into an extremely successful business um, that we're now the beneficiaries of that investment that he created. Uh, and so that was kind of said, let's take risks. Now I went into education, which is a kind of a risk averse thing to go into a job and a consistency but I also found when I was in the system that I kind of hit that mark where I said, I'm not making a difference. And I'm now feeling I'm part of the problem in what's happening within the system. And that was part of enough for me to say, I need to break out and do things outside of the system if I started to feel it constraining. But more importantly, seeing I was having a negative effect by being there. And 
<clears throat> so that led me out and I started to work for doing things that I loved, which is professional learning. And I did it for teachers um, and I did it for school administrators. And I shot my mouth off and they said, come and work. So I did. And that led me into the consulting area and working outside of K-12 education, but still very, very uh, intimately tied to it. So I live vicariously your interactions with students through you, um, but I have my own interactions that uh, I can talk about. So that's a little bit, let's see if we can get here. So that's a, a little bit about this. This, oh, sorry. I was supposed to be showing my slideshow when I was talking about me. Um, this is, uh, the deck is present, uh, available at our slideshare.net slash R Labonte is there, but I also got it in Google Drive if you want, we can give the links. So <clears throat> my career has led me into uh, the Can Learn and Canadian eLearning Network. And what happened is that uh, my passion for working with digital online pieces uh, got me into conversations with people at events like this, but those events were all sort of down at Inacol and south of the border. And as a consultant to try to get to those things, um, I tied it to a holiday, I tried to do all sorts of things to, in order to get me into the game to be there, but it was very problematic. But more importantly, once we were meeting and we did that kind of thing, we were going like, well, let's carry this conversation on the back in Canada. No, didn't happen. It just kind of died. So we actually said in 2013, we should do something formal and we thrashed it out. And in 2014, we actually decided we were going to form a national nonprofit. This is why I'm in the game. Okay. And the picture of five, it's now 10 grandkids. So that's where we're going. But what's interesting is I can do this stuff. Because I'm not tied to a business, I'm not tied to an organization. The national nonprofit is very independent and it's very much online. So I live now, to be closer to those grandchildren, I live in a place called Half Moon Bay. So if you see, you can see the line of the ferry. This was me as a five-year-old at this ferry terminal going across here to Nanaimo where I grew up and where dad built his business. But now I'm sort of back, that's another ferry albeit you can see it's a shorter ferry to go to uh, Langdale and Gibson's and then a drive up to Seashell. But what's there in Half Moon Bay? Why am I there? Well, I'm there because there is a float plane that flies out of here and goes to here in 20 minutes. So I can go wherever I want because I'm connected. I've got a ferry that goes and it's 40 minutes for me to get to grandkids over there. We've got a whole slew of them that they're growing there. So I'm connected. But it's not just that connection that does it. It's this connection. So we're running around all over the Sunshine Coast and I'm on this going two bars, nope, three bars, yep. <laughs> I got five, I'm staying here. And then tell us fiber. I've got the fastest internet connection I could get anywhere in the province of BC right now. Ta da! I arrived. So that connection is what drives most of everything, and it drives e-learning. It drives all of us and what we're doing, that ability to connect. So ergo, a network to connect. So this is what the network is about as well, to try to keep us focused, to keep us in sharing, and keep us informed from others. So it's a conduit. So really, people ask, well, what's your mandate? Just to connect things, connect people, connect ideas, connect resources, connect everything that we can. Because that's education. And it's not just between provinces. It's in school boards. It's in school divisions. It's in communities. So we are a fragmented, siloed kind of uh, enterprise. And the more that we can connect between the silos as opposed to try to streamline them together, the better off we are. Because we are there for independence and we're there because we perform best when we're looking at those kids in front of us and what their particular needs are. It's going to drive our practice and it should drive our practice. And therefore, what happens in your community is not what happens in Toronto District School Board, is not what happens in Half Moon Bay, is not what happens somewhere else. So 
how are we doing this for Candy Learn? Well, we're sharing, we're trying to share initiatives, we're trying to share things, but did I mention the whole no organization and not trying to have a mandate and not have a, a national sort of funder that tells us what we can do and can't do? We are self-made, just like my dad's company kind of business. So there's a lot of volunteerism. So without people on the board who are volunteering or offering their assistance to do this, uh, it doesn't happen. And it also happens because probably 60% of what I do, yeah, I don't get paid for. But as long as I get enough money to keep going, then I get paid for because I make an impact, because I make a difference for people, and ultimately impact children and the future for my grandchildren. So I'm a little bit selfish in those. So we, we've done a leadership summit. I want to talk to you a little bit about that before we, we close off as well. Um, I'll, PD learning course, and we want to extend that. Now, it's no uh, small surprise that in our board of directors, that not only do we have Todd, uh, we've also got uh, Paul Lachance now. Uh, we've got Chantal Gauthier from Cavalfield. Paul is on a cruise still. He's not back yet. <laughs> he wandered away for a whole month. Yes, he, he did retire. Uh, but Paul's going to continue uh, because he's passionate about what we're doing and support Candy Learn. But Capital Fo, uh on the board is going to be um, with Chantal. Uh, and then, of course, Michael and Sue Taylor Foley and a few others. And it, the board appointee is David Porter. Now, David Porter is a colleague. Uh, he's hailed out of Ontario as well as back in BC. And I got to know David quite well and sat down and had a beer with him and asked him if he thought that he could help us in our um, a group. And he said, absolutely. So he's been a great help on the board strategically, but also by saying, you know, for that, uh, take the extend and just use it, turn it into something for K to 12, brand it, publish it like we did at eCampus Ontario. He says, and I, my staff will help you. So that's my challenge and project that I've got going. So, but that's not all that we sort of brand ourselves for. The other thing is around research. And if you've not looked at the site before, the K12 state of the nation.ca, SOTN is state of the nation. Um, that's where Michael Barber, uh, who was also instrumental in founding Canny Learn and is still an active voluntary contributor, huge, huge contributor. Actually, I wouldn't be here. I think I probably would have given up if it wasn't for Mr. Barber because he's relentless, <laughs> a positive relentless um, for the most part. When, and so it's, it's a great privilege to be able to share his passion, which is this research through Canny Learn, which broadens his channels and his reach uh, with that as well. But like a researcher, he's independent. He is the principal researcher, and I assist in that. And we publish it here, not because we don't want to publish it on Canny Learn. It's just the sheer volume of documentation and information here overwhelms one website. So we put it as an independent website. And what uh, Michael has is, is determined is through consultations with the different provincial ministries as well. Uh, basically, we kind of follow to a simple pattern. So across the north, they're either these, both Northwest Territories as well as Yukon, are starting their own programs independent of ministries, but the ministry offers that. But they also take BC's curriculum and they enroll in other online schools here. And then this is Alberta-based curriculum there, so they enroll with ADLC. Uh, and then, uh, of course, in Nunavut, there's not much going on. And then you kind of go across. These are all government-based Ministry of Ed programs that are provincially run, provincially funded, so it's part of that. So there isn't this disconnect between the provincial ministry and the funding part of it into the program because it's a direct relationship, uh, as opposed to others that in Quebec, uh, some centrally is done for in terms of distance learning. But uh, there's also very large uh, district-based kind of initiatives. You know what's going on in Ontario. Um, and then here it's sort of a mix of some of the provincial as well as some of the district-based programs. Uh, not as robust and rich necessarily. In Alberta, uh, ADLC was going to take over the world for a while there. I was part of the DE review, and then they changed the funding model, and the whole thing just went. Um, so ADLC still has a very strong role in terms of uh, making sure that the rural students are connected to learning opportunities and they will do partnerships with the local districts. But a lot of the local school divisions actually have their own programs to deal with their own students. 
and in BC, it's kind of like, as you'll hear from Richard a little bit uh, after this, is it's kind of the wild, wild west in the sense that it was all over the place to a certain extent. So what's interesting about that is that when you look at what's across the country, there really isn't a lot of regulation. BC has the most legislation policy, and they have a separate distributed learning agreement. So it is the most regulated of them. Um, but it also has the, the deepest per capita in penetration in e-learning, which is, you think the regulations would stop it? No, it actually helps describe it. But more importantly, it's the funding that does. So the funding follows the individual students. So if I'm a school A and I have this student sign up for my course, I get the money directly. If I'm in school B and I sign up a student, then I get the money directly. If you're here with part of the OELC, yeah, a student signs up for your course over here, and Todd figures it out, <laughs> right? That's, that's pretty much how it works. <laughs> Some magical IT and all sorts of software programs that go in between. Um, so, and in Nova Scotia, it's in the collective agreement. Now, within that, first of all, in BC, guess what? They're doing a funding review. Guess what? They're going to change that funding model. We already know that but that's gonna have a direct impact on the programs. As a matter of fact, there's some of the DL programs there. They, this is not gonna kick in until the year after next, but they're going, uh, next year's my last year, I know I'm not gonna have a program, the funding's gonna just like collapse and we're not gonna be able to do it. And what does that mean for students that are actively getting a very sound education from there? So the devil's in the details, don't know that that's gonna happen yet, stop fear-mongering, let's just wait and see where the dust settles, is sort of the note there. In Nova Scotia, it's in the collective agreement, but teachers have gone into the ministry's program to work within the ministry's program. So they do follow that and they do fund it uh, appropriately. Uh, and I got in a discussion in Saskatchewan where I was there earlier this week. Class size. Class size and working conditions. So they're bringing it up. And basically, my comment there is like, be careful of hard and fast numbers uh, because as soon as you write it into a language, that it means one thing in one perspective or context when you do that. But what about this? What about that? What about those students? What about this? What about this? So the beauty that's happened in e-learning is its flexibility for students also has created flexibility for educators in how they manage those students. And we put down numbers and metrics. It fits a centralized model or ideology, and it doesn't necessarily fit there for kids. And so that's sort of my cautionary note about how that's there. But so again, just across Canada, so all, most of the provinces and territories have some form of direct provincial uh, direction and involvement. And I put Ontario on that list because, well, you'll see why. On the West, AKA the wild, wild West, that's twice, and I'll not say it again, Richard, I promise, um, is there isn't really any provincial direction other than BC to regulate and put policies in front. They really don't supply any resources. They really don't supply any technologies. They leave it up to the districts to figure out what to do, um, which is okay. Autonomy and independence is, is okay, uh, but is there enough money provided? Well, then you get into that argument about not enough money, and too much money back and forth. It depends on which side of the fence that you're standing. Um, and the same conversations can go on in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So. Despite all that, what we're seeing is completion rates when these first came out, and we've, I'm using BC stats because they're the ones that have been tracking this for the longest period of time. But when e-learning came out, probably four years into it, is essentially students that were taking one or more of those distributed learning courses didn't graduate or didn't do quite as well as the students that were not taking the courses. But that flipped just after. And all of a sudden, if you're taking an online course, you're gonna do better than if you'd sat in a school to take whatever courses you could. Uh, and that's because the offerings are better, it's because the fit for the student is better, it's also because I think that e-learning courses are designed and uh, accommodate individual students' needs and preferences much better. That similar statistic is now being seen across in other provinces, and I think, I don't know, Todd, do you have stats that would sort of back up that as well? Something similar? Yeah. So I would argue, though, by based on anecdotal commentary and connections I've had with people, is that kids are doing better because of e-learning, not despite e-learning. So 
the question comes up and it did, this is one of those questions that came out of the announcement and I've got more on the announcement later, but just on this notion of centralized, decentralized in Canada, which is better? It depends. Which is more successful? Both are successful because you put good teachers in front of students, you're gonna end up with good results. So whether it's centralized or decentralized is irrelevant. It's, it's, I like the line, and this isn't exactly, it's a bit of a paraphrase, but it's like saying that, you know, you should go buy the milk at the store as opposed to have it delivered. Well, it doesn't really matter. Nutrition isn't based on how you deliver or get something. It's on how it's interpreted and used in that situation, which my mom made me drink milk. Turns out I had an enzyme intolerance to it, but I still, she made it to German. Did I tell you that? Um, anyway, so there's, that kind of tells you a little bit about this and really what it comes down to, and this was something when, when, when Michael Barber and I were first talking about it, and he just said, look, he says, it's not the right question, does e-learning work? It's under what conditions? Because yes, it works. And can it work for everyone? Absolutely. You just have to modify the conditions. You've got to have supports. So to me, that's flipping the conversation to a certain extent. It's, uh, it's, it's really important that when you, when you have a conversation about e-learning, you don't accept the premise that someone that asks you the question provides. Reject the premise and talk about the, your own constructs about e-learning. It's what politicians do. Someone asks them a question, and they turn and say what they want to say with some slim sort of connection, sometimes not at all, to what the question was. So don't accept someone's paradigm when you're trying to talk about e-learning, I think is a really important point. So smaller jurisdictions, possibly because it's easier to centralize, and uh, that's what happens in certainly the Atlantic provinces. Others are decentralized because they're large enough and they can do stuff independently within that. No significant difference. Okay, the medium isn't the issue, change the paradigm. So let me stop there about that research. I want to get into some more specific things, but do you have questions about what you've seen so far? Okay, I'm gonna make you talk after. Okay, so the other thing that noticed around in the research, and this isn't really apparent, we can't really draw it out of the research, but it's more about us walking about and kicking tires and talking to people, is as much as in many jurisdictions, there's competition for students, particularly like in BC, you think, because if I get new, I get funded right away, and there's a lot of others that are funded if they claim those students. Um, it's shifting away and back from competing against others. It's much more focused towards trying to deal with and support students in their communities, in their local jurisdictions. Um, so that's one of the first things that's important. The other one that does come up is that it's really about integrating to what's going on in the classroom. Because at first, e-learning was the anomaly. It was that program that you dumped kids into when you didn't want them in your school. And so the administrators got away with that. And somebody's, well, it's, they're still getting away with it in many places, but somebody's got to call their column on it because you're part of a whole educational program for a whole multitude of students that are a district or a division's responsibility or a board's responsibility in the case of Ontario. It's, you, you have to do it jointly. You have to do it collectively. So some of the programs in BC, I know we're shifting into they had centralized programs, now they're shifting into integrated programs. How they did that, they engaged a conversation with all of their senior district administrators, counselors, as well as school administrators and counselors to talk about how that worked. Now, for those of you in Ontario, you're gonna go, well, yeah, right? You're doing that already, right? For the most part, tell me I'm wrong. One little head nod. Michael's going, no, you're not wrong. So. And so it's not a surprise. Oh my God. Some of the other places in this country, it would be a shock because that doesn't happen. So consider yourself lucky on there. But this is where we want to go. E-learning is just another way to, for kids to engage. So, and you've seen probably something, this is coming from Jared Bora, uh, the research, uh, who was actually Michael's um, graduate student that he supervised his, his doctoral work. But basically, the model is teachers kind of independent in e-learning and it's around all different schools, but what's constant is there's some kind of a mentoring supporting teacher 
that's in each of the buildings, and the parents are kind of they wander around on the outside of that, and they might interface with uh, you know school A, school B, school C, or whatever, de depending on the program and what's being taken. But that model has the teacher sort of in a central place, but the supports right there where they're needed. In some cases, the teacher and the mentor are the same person, okay, in the school. And that would be similar to what it is that I'm thinking a lot of practices here. Okay, sorry, and again, this is posted, so you can grab it afterwards. So it really is talking about taking the design of teacher-driven content dissemination in a classroom with 30 kids in front of them, oh, sorry, 22 kids in front of them, um, and, but it's really about this hodgepodge of stuff about different, and oh, guess what? So the curriculum changed to be more personalized. So I think that's important. But that support, and this is a great little study if you want to look at it, is about the, the, the role of that uh, online, the, the on-site mentor in the instructional support is absolutely critical. And that's, that's really important to kind of keep in mind as people start looking at e-learning as just electronic delivery of curriculum and kids just sort of rationalize it, manage it, and kick it back. So the supports are the, the important part. And Fullen, I think, says it probably the best in terms of people look for technology solutions, technology solutions to make life simpler or cheaper. And we're guilty of it. We do it. But... Education doesn't fit that model or that mod, uh, mode at all. It's pedagogy that drives education, pedagogy that drives you to do things differently, and that's to meet success for students. So pedagogy first, always. Don't pick technology because it's good. Don't go to Google Classrooms because it's great. You can do all this. You can do that, that, that. If there's no pedagogical reason, just keep handing out worksheets. Okay. So I told you a little bit about BC not having a lot of central support and direction. So essentially what happened is districts started to band together and help each other out. So they started to form consortia. Well, what happened in the BC Learning Network where they started to get some agreement on joint sharing or hosting for Moodle, which is the LMS they used, then they also started to share course development. And rather than people doing what Alberta started to do as well. Well, sorry, it is in here. The Alberta Moodle Hub, rather than teachers just throwing their courses into a central spot and then people going in to cherry pick, that didn't work because it's way too time intensive. Instead, what they did is they shared resources to get one or two teachers together to build a course that then was shared back to everyone. And then teachers could rip it apart and change it and modify it and do whatever it is that teachers do, which is, we all do that. Um, so they found centralizing those resources was, was the best way. But as indicated, you'll, you'll hear a little bit, this is what caused content connections to form as a company, what StudyForge was doing, because you'll hear from Richard in terms of sort of his methodologies and structure that he uses. And all of a sudden, it got to the point where he's going like, I got to find a way to actually rationalize helping people out because I'm going crazy and I'm not teaching <laughs> and I'm not getting paid to do this. So that's kind of what happens in the West. And another one that's done, I, whether you've ha heard of e-dynamic uh, learning, but they're also another one that grew out of Calgary. So BC, West Canada has a, a repertoire. Desire to learn is huge, right? Obviously in Ontario. It's not in other parts of the province, but it's in the U.S. came out of again, Canada, for that, Illuminate Live, which then became Blackboard Collaborate, okay? I came out of Calgary. We've got a real strong, rich history of innovation, I think, because we have challenges here that are a little bit different from the larger urban areas, and we managed to kind of tackle them. So that's really good innovation. So this WCLN now is moving into Saskatchewan, uh, because not because they're trying to take ownership, because they're finding that the teachers and the programs there are looking for that kind of uh, support that's going on. So to go back again, that's what happened in the West because it's not there, educators are creating it, but you've got leadership here, and this is the Randy saying, count your blessings, uh, not what you're, you're missing. You've got leadership through three very active and centralized uh, consortia. You've got a central 
ministry that you have TELT, you have TELT, you've got uh, professional learning modules that are produced centrally for you, you get a free LMS, free courses, you got a centralized licensing for distribution of new tools and getting them, and, and you've got, oh, did I say provincial funding? You, you have provincial funding to support that. That doesn't exist everywhere else, okay? It's not to say that there are challenges, but it's to say that thinking again in the narrative, you've got a lot of base and rich history and you are built some excellent successful programs. The question is now is, is in terms of maintaining them. Um, and the government has made a commitment to you know, rural access. Uh, in Alberta, they made that commitment a number of years ago for SuperNet and SuperNet was the reason why I could go to Gift Lake when I was working for a little group called Alberta North and uh, supporting the local coordinator, that mentor or supporter in that remote community, where they could actually help out with some of the uh, community members. They would come in there because there was a pipe. They had no internet. There was no such thing as online or even computer for most of the people in Gift Lake's community. But they would come into the local uh, satellite, one portable, you know, for Northern Lakes College. And there was one person that was in there on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that would help them. And they could use that connection to look up a, for a job possibility, to help with a resume, or to connect to a course to get them a little bit closer to their high school diploma. And then if they had enough money, they could actually get into possibly some of the college courses. So that's coming, that was huge in Alberta, still is huge in Alberta. So this kind of a development is, is terrific. But then this happens. So just when you think, Things are really going really well. This isn't this great. And then all of a sudden, this level of activity, which has a tempest in the teapot kind of tipping things over kind of feeling to it. So, and this is where we jumped in. Before I go into this, because I do want to spend a little bit of time on this, I want to ask this question. Is we have done a couple of leadership summits as Candy Learn in the summer, in August. Um, and in Ontario was where two were quite successful. We did one in Nova Scotia. We didn't do one in BC because uh, we would have tied it to the distributed learning, um, sorry, the digital learning conference symposium there. My question back to you is given the attention and the possibilities that that brings here, would there be an interest in another meeting or a get together like this uh, with some focused dialogue and discussion in August here in the Toronto area? I have looked at York University because we've done it there before, and I believe we might have some buildings and space available at York University in late August. My question is interest, need, timing before I jump in and we talk a little bit about some of these uh, issues that are we're playing around. You want to stop and think about it and make that a discussion at the break and maybe Todd, we can solicit some feedback on that notion. Okay, sounds like a fair idea. Okay, so this, this happened. We all of a sudden started to hear uh, the media pieces and reports and then I got asked by a reporter the Ottawa Citizen reporter, Joanne, all of a sudden contacted me as Candy Learn. I'm going like, uh, I got checked with the board. What's Todd going to say? <laughs> and uh, in that notion, because, but what we had done as a board before in a retreat, the board had reinvigorated Candy Learn, not because we had to be careful because uh, Sue Taylor Foley, is works for the Ministry of Ed in Nova Scotia. Um, and they're uh, being a civil servant, uh, they're not, they have to be very careful about being lobbied or being, uh, you know, at someone advocating for a particular thing in there. And as Canny learned, we like say we're, we're, we're Switzerland, we're neutral in all of this, but we can, because we're neutral, we're not driven to be told to shut up by anyone. Uh, we can bring things forward or information forward. Uh, in that, that sort of an area. And Candy Learn's mission was kind of revised to be the leading voice in Canada for blended and online. 
Well, we got the research, we got everything else. If we're gonna be the leading voice, then that means if somebody's talking about e-learning, maybe we better stand up and talk about e-learning as well. And I like to say it's better to fill the, the room with your voice and some defensible research, as long as you're not talking up the side of your head, than to listen to someone else bring forward some ideas or notions. So we kind of put this synopsis together and it's right now is linked to a page and this is may grow out to be a little bit larger where we have to do some redirecting to something else. But if you look at cannylearn.net um, and then you can find it if you go over to research and then I posted it down below in the drop down menu. But this is a page which on this page there are links to some of the issues which were brought forward to us from some of you here but also that we picked up on in the media, uh, which were kind of myths, uh, misrepresentations of what was going that were contrary to what we found in our own research that we've done. So that's something which, which we want to continue to do. And of course, you've heard some of these myths, but this uh, Michael Barber did a piece on myths now that it's published as well there. Uh, and it's really about uh, mirrored on some of the myths from before that were published through iNACL and DLAX got some myths and so they're out there so we just thought well let's reinvigorate them and give them some new uh, pieces so this is a, a piece of information which you should keep in the back in case you need to use some of that of course I don't want to talk about these issues or the myths because there are certainly they're myths because they're applied to all e-learning programs that's not to say that that doesn't happen in some programs, okay? But it's the problem is generalizing from the minor minority into the majority. So that's the part that we really want to do because we know it's successful in both rural and urban. It's mainstream. It's, the success rates are high. The 20 to 30% is a figure that we dug out of the correspondence model uh, in the past when it was centralized and it was simply course delivery through electronic or physical medium. And that was not successful because there was no engagement, really. Um, so that thing, that's an important part that gets missed half, all the time when you're talking to people. Well, it's an online course. They can log in from anywhere. They can do it anytime they want to. Are they doing it? And what is the course? Is it just reading content? Because if that's, that's not what happens in a classroom. It's not what happens in an online robust program. Um, and the other thing that's successful now, and a really drive, something to keep driving forward, is integrated with what's going on in the classroom. It's one of, it's part of. If I'm a classroom teacher now, if I was back in there, I would have a whole online presence. I'd be all over it, and I would be doing group things. When I was uh, doing my, I was a TA at uh, UBC when I was doing, this was before uh, online platforms. And so I was teaching uh, philosophy education. 300 level course. And I looked at that and I'm going like, well, uh, we want you to lecture and you know, with your PowerPoints and then have a series of questions and give the readings to the students and they have to do assignments and you mark them. I was going, that sounds a lot like correspondence to me. And so I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. So what I did was I emailed my PowerPoint, the presentation, with a series of group questions that we were going to address when we met as a class and the class met and they were all in groups. I didn't teach. I didn't do anything from the front. I made them do that. They had to finish the assignment, hand in the assignment. Oh, and also, I made sure that they had a journal. So that they had to email me journal entries for every single week and their own personal reflections, and I answered back to them. And we used our face-to-face -face time to be noisy. Apparently too noisy. They didn't let me teach again. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's, we're here for that. But specifically some of the, the, the sort of the myths and the commentary that came, when you start to look at what was announced, and this is, I know it's a conversation, Todd and your consortium have represented you extremely well in terms of bringing their voices to, to uh, Ontario Ministry, and they're listening. The people that, that you connect with, they're, they're listening. They're solid educators, they're, they're, they're good professionals. They're not, they're not the devil in disguise here. What, what it comes down to is a clash between uh, economic drivers in, in the provincial government versus pedagogical drivers. And we know what Fullen said. So um, the scalability is, is sort of an issue, so we pulled some numbers together just to help you off the bat. 
So Todd is saying, and you, you did say in your, your words, it was 10 times uh, in terms of that. That's, that's, a, that's a goal. That's a mountain. But it can be done because there are ways and means that you know. But it can be done if it's resourced and it's set up correctly in terms of how it rolls out. Um, whether it becomes four after it gets rationalized is, is, I don't know. We'll see. That's a political question. But I still think that an increase in e-learning is a good thing. The fact that you have a government that announces that it's a good thing, then let's hope that that's a good thing as well. But there are issues that will come with that because you've got to have labs, access, bandwidth, there's all sorts of supervision, support, and all of those things to maintain quality. And so as educators, our continued pointing to quality is absolutely imperative. So it's one thing to try to save money, but if it's at the cost of quality or ability for students to engage in learning, that's a non-starter because that's not what the mandate for public education is about. And all we have to do is keep reminding people so they don't get lost in those. And more centralized, I don't know what that means. That's the question here. But we know that centralized models can work, but they typically don't work in large areas. They typically are used in smaller areas and in larger areas, it's more decentralized to be more effective uh, to the local student or those who you're engaging with there. We know that if it's going to get bigger, student skills, teacher skills, professional learning for pre-service who are coming into this for sustainability need to change and improve. And we absolutely must keep a barometer on Aboriginal, Francophone, and rural learners because they are the ones that are not necessarily in the voting sectors for politicians, but they are the ones that get wiped out first. We have to absolutely be imperatively careful about that. And I know that's, we've got uh, learned here from Quebec as well, but I know I spent many years over the past while with the Cavalfo, with the Francophone school boards and their consortium and how they're trying to re preserve the Francophone language for Ontario. It's the same thing that we went through. We did a little uh, a research paper for Jean Magrand at CFED about the same thing. So some of this information is also posted on Ours. And the other thing is that if e-learning is going to be doing all this, what am I going to be like as a classroom teacher if I just want to go to a computer lab or I want to use something, some of the tech that's now all of a sudden gobbled up by all these kids that have to learn online? What about them? Let's not forget about them. And then who's going to supervise this now 10% of the students at any one point in time that are going to be taking an online course? Like, do you have the bodies in place? What's the model for that? How does that work? I know that the bodies are there now, but this is a model that's evolved over a period of time. So scaling it, that's the, that's the challenge. And of course, special needs students can be exempt. We did hear that one exemption there, um, but let's not forget about the fact that it's just not, oh, we don't have to worry about them in this. If everyone is e-learning and, and the intakes and the, the, the post-secondaries or the trades or, or businesses are looking for those skill sets, E-learning is for everyone, but it's how you use it and how you, how, you, how you model it. So let's not forget that. So there's a lot of, wow, need to pay attention to. So these are thoughts, actions, responsibilities. To me, this is an ongoing conversation and an ongoing dialogue. And it needs to happen here. It needs to happen in your own, you know, boards, authorities, in your schools, within your programs. But I think... For me, what I've learned, ha happening within an educator's like sort of community is where some good ideas can spread, some support can be found. And I think it's really important that we look towards having those conversations. Get people like this Barbara and myself to bring you information or to find out stuff that you may need to help you in those conversations. And let's just put the hard reality of what's going on and what success is on the table. Because at the end, we're all people that are trying to do the best for students and trying to do it without blowing the bank wide open. There's a balance, and there will always be a balance. But to me, it's really about the dialogue that's the critical part for moving forward. So that's kind of my message for that. And you can feel free to contact me, look me up, or do whatever, or we can just chat about some things right now before. Richard pops up, and if you want to get hooked up, you can do that. <clears throat>
I want as a VC has uh, some services and personal experience uh, to serve. Uh, paper. <laughs> they dressed it with two papers. Uh, there's there is a, a little bit more uh, the regional community gathering approach, and that's also why the schools themselves, the local communities, are taking more uh, responsibility and involvement in because uh, that the community base and the connection is really what's what's important. You can't rely on the internet as being the only connection for students. You've worked extensively with uh, various people in the world. You don't quite get what how the region What do you see as the, the benefits? Like, what do you see as the absolute strength of what's been built here in Ontario that perhaps may be lacking elsewhere in Canada? Other than the, the you know, I mean, LMS, having books that are, that are written and provided, having health contracts, all of that stuff is absolutely fantastic. And I understand that it's a privilege compared to a lot of the other provinces, but what do you see as the infrastructure in terms of the built up in the model? The collaboration is the absolute epitome of, of, of what that is. Um, the, the consortia models are strong, and I know there's a northern consortium group as well that I haven't mentioned that's, that's part of it, maybe not quite as formalized. But it's it's how it, you galvanize together as educators, despite a numbers, large numbers. I mean, one of your school divisions is bigger than some some of the other places where you know, and one school is bigger than three districts in some of the provinces. Uh, but you've man managed to maintain that sort of connection, and I know only through through you thought and conversations and talking with some of your board, uh, there is a real drive to help each other out and to find economies within that helping. So there's never really just, well, this I need for my kid and you need to give it to me now, Gavin. I don't care if it costs a million dollars. I, you know, there is a realism that comes in the conversations and the dialogue that you have and you're doing that. But there's also a dedicated persistence that I, I see in helpers. And I, I noted it years and years ago in the Franklin program. They just didn't give up. They just kept going. And they have that same rich, robust conversation communication that carries on as well. And in the Franklin community, because it's smaller, it's basically across Canada. They still have strong connections across most of the country as well, which I think is, those to me are the important parts of what it is that Ontario is doing. And despite having the, the gifts, as I said, um, you'd still be successful in what you're doing, even without that. Oops, I should have said that comment. Was that online? <laughs> <laughs> Did that answer your it question? Does, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Randy, just on behalf of all of us here and the consortium, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to travel all this way to come with us. Take time out of uh, your family life, left that away from the grandbabies to be here with us today. I uh, certainly appreciate kind of how you summarized what's happening across Canada. I found it rather interesting, you know, and I'm sure we'll hear about Alberta a little bit more, how Alberta now seems to be where we were, certainly as a consortium back in the early 2000s when we were at the Strategic Alliance for E-Learning. Before we had the, the LMS and the, the Ministry support. Um, so it's in, appreciated how you kind of highlighted the things that we do have um, and certainly raised questions around where we go now. So I certainly appreciate uh, your expertise. Great.